All right, we're going to get started. In case you haven't noticed, I'm not Adrian Mathenia. I'm Todd Hutcherson, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, I think I know everybody in here except for the couple in the back. So uh, I've been here for 23 years at Buck Run and have taught every class imaginable, imaginable C groups, Sunday school classes, um, and, and I used to sing in the choir, but I have a D group of seventh grade boys now on Wednesday nights, so I'm pouring into them as much as I can, so that's why I cannot sing anymore on the choir. I know, I know, I've, I've heard it a thousand times, <laughs> but um, let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, Lord, uh, forgive us of our sins for they are many, but your mercy is new every morning. Uh, Father, I just pray that you would illuminate us, illuminate this word of yours, um, that we can see it, apply it to our lives, and live it out. It's in your son's holy and precious name I pray, amen. All right, we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 20, um, and then rip through the rest of Exodus, and get through Leviticus. That's the goal. Um, so the main idea, God establishes the covenant with his people at Sinai in order that he might dwell among them and, might, and they might live in fellowship with him. And the rest of Exodus is going to tell us just how they do that. And then Leviticus tells us how we can be holy or tells them how they that they can be holy, and and do that, um, per, you know, periodically, every day they live this out. Um, so there's the covenant obligations. God gives the people of Israel laws that allow them to dwell in His presence, and He did that in giving them the Ten Commandments. So this is this is the the um, the roadmap for them to be in fellowship with God, that they can be in presence of God. Um, so we have the Ten Commandments, how the people should relate to God, verses 1 through 4, um, and how the people should, um, how that, um, how the people should relate to one another. That's 5 through 10. So, the first bit of the Ten Commandments, you have a vertical relationship, establishing how uh, what God expects of them through the first four. And the last five is a horizontal relationship, how they fellowship with one another in five through ten. Um, commandments and the covenant of grace. Uh, the law teaches God's people how to image him. How are they to live as those who are the recipients of God's covenant promises to Abraham? They are to be holy. Uh, Exodus 19.6 says they are to be holy. The law shows them how they can live holy, set-apart lives before God, as his, uh, before God as his people. And the law reveals who God is and therefore how his people are to represent him. Now, let's not forget that the people are leaving Egypt. They're in Sinai. If you know anything about Sinai, it is a desolate desert place. It's rocky. It's craggy. It's dry. There's nothing there. Um, so they're leaving Egypt. They're in Sinai, and they're going to the promised land where there are uh, there's people already there. But the Lord has promised that he would drive them out. And thus, they're going to be surrounded by other civilizations. So this is why they have to have first the Ten Commandments and then living through that in Leviticus. They're going to be set apart. Holy means set apart. Um, so now we get, what if, what if the law is broken? Uh, the law leads us to Christ. Galatians Chapter 3, 17 through 19, it does not replace God's promises to Abraham. The law reveals our own sinfulness to us and drives us by faith to God for a solution. 
uh, promises, I mean, promise comes before the law. The law was given to Israel as a saved people, not as a means for salvation. The law was not to be understood as a means by which people could earn God's favor. Let's never forget that. Um, but a means by which people could recognize their own sin and be driven to God by faith. Um, so that's the covenant obligations. Covenant disobedience and covenant grace is covered in chapters 32 through 34. Um, that's the tabernacle. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, this section specifically, Exodus 33, serves as a center point for the second half of the book of Exodus. Uh, and therefore, of, it's, a, it's of central importance. Israel fails to live up to the standard God sets for them. But God offers grace to preserve his relationship with his people. The people's idolatry with the golden calf is a demonstration of their covenant disobedience. Um, God justly responds to their, to their idolatry and covenant disobedience with the appropriate wrath. Uh, and the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So God's not happy with the situation with the golden calf and lays out the ultimatum for Moses. But Moses intervenes. Moses prays to God that let this not happen. Uh, give them a second chance, and God relents. He does. But there's consequences that go along with that. So Moses intercedes on behalf of the people, uh, and Moses appeals according to God's own glory among the nations and pictures the intercession of Jesus on behalf of his people. So if you read the Pentateuch, and I recommend reading, and it's difficult, I will admit, but it's meant to be read as one entire book, the first five from Moses. Uh, you can't sit down and read it in one sitting. Don't try. Uh, but have that in mind, that this is one whole work. And keep that in mind as you think of running through the New Testament and Jesus coming to this earth and dwelling among us, tabern tabernacling with us, just like God tabernacles with the with the Israelites, the Hebrews, in the tabernacle. Um, so that brings us to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the, a covenant meeting place. God sets up this dwelling place among his people. It is in many ways a solution for the problem of God's continued presence among a sinful and rebellious people. Uh, he, gives a very, he gives very, very specific instructions on how the tabernacle is to be made what it's to be made of, uh, very specific dimensions. You can't read what these dimensions are, but um, it tells you. <laughs> the Bible tells you exactly how this thing is supposed to be supposed to be built. It's not a very it's not a very elegant thing. It's a tent. Uh, remember, the entire nation of Israel is in tents at this point. They don't have a solid rest. They're all intense. So picture this, if you will, allow your mind to go uh, to this place, a plain in Sinai in the desert uh, with the tabernacle set up in the middle of the nation. And the nation is set up with tents all around it according to their tribes. And then you have a central meeting place. You have the tabernacle. And this thing is portable. This thing's made to be taken down. It's got tent stakes and poles and 
uh, curtains and the holy furniture, and you know it's it's got an altar uh, and all kinds of things. And the central part of this is that second chamber in the tent is the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant is, the mercy seat. That's where God dwells. He dwells with his people. He is able to because they were exacting and putting this thing together for, for God himself. Um, it's where atonement for sins is made. Uh, it's where God reveals himself to his people. Uh, and where God is reconciled with his people, where, where God's glory dwells, that's a physical place for the invisible God to manifest himself, and where God can be known. Now, I just gave you six, what, one, two, three, seven points there that sound like they came right out of Exodus, but they didn't. They came out right out of the New Testament. You got Hebrews 9.26. John 14, 6, um, Hebrews 1, and t- 1, verse 2, Romans 5, verse 11, John 1, 14, uh, Colossians 2, 9, and John 14, 7. So I do that just to draw the parallel between the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, I think that's so important for us to do. Uh, the Old Testament's important, but we also get to see how the New Testament parallels. You could see Jesus paralleling what happens here as the tabernacle's built. Jesus comes down, he tabernacles with us, and we have the first rendition of that here in the tabernacle. Um, not ready to go here yet. Hold on. (laughs) So we have the covenant presence, uh, the promised, Exodus 24, Moses, Aaron, and the elders of Israel feast in the glory of God's presence. Moses also enters into God's presence for 40 days and 40 nights to receive the law. And it's realized in Exodus 40, uh, verses 34 through 38, God's glory fills the tabernacle, testifying to God's covenant uh, presence among his people. Through obedience to the law and the holy participation in the rituals of the tabernacle, Israel is able to commune with God despite their sin. Uh, So this covenant presence and relation between God and his people is the climax of redemptive history so far. We got a lot to go through, culminating in the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, So God's presence among his people has been restored like Eden. Now, another thing I wanted to mention about the tabernacle, inside of the tabernacle is pictured palm trees and cherubim. And the last time that they, and they meaning two people, got to see this was back in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were dwelling with God until the fall. Until, the, until sin entered the world. So even inside of the tabernacle, Eden is pictured. We're, and we've been striving, they've been striving to get to Eden ever since. Um, so how is the Holy Spirit's indwelling of the Christian better revealed, uh, God's revealed presence in the tabernacle. Let me start over that question. This is for discussion. How is the Holy Spirit's indwelling of the Christian better than God's revealed presence in the tabernacle? Yeah, that's exactly right. It is. That's right, because what happened on the cross? The curtain was torn in two. Uh, that's a, I love that detail uh, given to us in the Gospels, that, that that's no longer there. That division is no longer there. Anybody else? Yes, absolutely. Um, not that this, not that the 
being in tabernacle or being in the in the nation of Israel couldn't be personal. I mean, they they had a means to commune with God. It just it wasn't as personal. It wasn't something that they could have uh, every day. In my prayer, I said, "Forgive us of our sins, for they are many, but your mercy is new every morning." That's that's personal. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even then, God provided a way. There was, there was atonement. There was a way. Yeah. It is. Exactly. I mean, he didn't have... He didn't have a permanent home until Solomon built the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Um, and even then, even then, we have the advantage of looking through Scripture and saying, well, that's temporary too, you know, because that, that, that got torn down, and that's, that was done. So we have an advantage there. But it was temporary as well. They built it as if, as if it was going to be permanent to last forever, but... That's exactly right. I, I think the details in Exodus and Leviticus, uh, they just scream. Uh, they, it just screams how intent that God, Yahweh, was in uh, being with his people. He wanted to be with his people, but his people had to do certain things to get there. Number one, assembling the, the tabernacle. Number two, observing everything that goes along with it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Only every day. Uh, I think also when we're reading stuff, we, we tend to we tend to, when the next event happens, think that that happened yesterday. And that's not really true either. It's, I'm not giving uh, the Hebrews any, uh, any grace on this. I mean, it's pretty evident as to what the Lord wanted them to do. They just didn't do it. Uh, and he calls them out. He says they're stiff-necked people. And he wants to... He wants to be done with the whole lot until Moses says, ah, I don't think we want to do that. Or I know I don't, I know you don't want to do that. And that's the amazing thing about Moses' prayer. And to say that prayer, people say that prayer doesn't change things, I say, let's, let's look through the Old Testament and see just how much prayer changes things. More getting our will in line with his than anything else. Um, yeah.
Yes. Yeah, it's it's really it's really mind boggling to come down to it. Uh, the Lord wants to be done with the lot, uh, but does He really? Uh, and then Moses interceding for the the Hebrews and saying, "God, you don't want to do this, do you?" Uh, <laughs> and then and then we get the rest of the story. Um, so it's. It, it really is. It's mind-boggling sometimes. Um, anything else on Exodus, the last half of Exodus? Any questions? I know there are many. This is the 40,000-foot view. My daughter is actually, she's at Cedarville University in Ohio, and she's actually taking Old Testament literature right now. And I'm taking it with her uh, through their uh, Bible Minor program, which is free, by the way, if you want to go to cedarville.edu and check it out. You can sign up for it. It's free. It's five courses. Uh, it's And it's very well done. Very, very well done. Her current professor, Dr. Miller, I know why that the students just love him because he, he throws in an excitement to the Old Testament like I've never seen before. It's, it's a thing to behold. Enough about the commercial for Cedarville and uh, <laughs> where my daughter is fortunate to go. Um, okay, Leviticus. So Leviticus, in context, the main idea, God is holy. Again, what does holy mean? Set apart. Uh, God is holy, therefore his people must be holy too. Um, so Leviticus has a bad reputation as the destroyer of through-the-year Bible plans. Uh, have you experienced this? Has anybody, I, this looks unanimous, by the way. Um, why does it have this reputation? When you break it down to that, do's and don'ts, yeah, it can be a drudgery. A lot is. Absolutely, absolutely. We have to remember again, the Hebrews are going into a land that's promised to them but has been previously occupied by other societies, other nations. So, and then when they, when that, when they get driven out, they're surrounded like I said earlier, they're surrounded by those nations, uh, and they have to deal with that. And that's why Leviticus is here, because they're going to be really different than everybody else around them. That's the whole point. If you want to boil it down, that's the reason it's here. Uh, they are going to be really different than the folks that are that are there, the folks that are practicing infant sacrifice and uh, are really sexually immoral, uh, you know, leaving nothing on, on, on the table. Just really, just some really awful things going on. And the in steps the Hebrews who are going to be, going to be completely different. He, the Lord gives them instruction for everything everything in their life that they can be with or be around these people. So he's going to give them these sets of rules so that they can image him. They're going to reflect his glory to the nations around them. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound New Testament as well? Exactly. Okay. I get it. Here's a here's a tip. I do the first two syllables, and if I can't pronounce the rest of them, I'm moving on. <laughs> and that's, there's usually four or five syllables after that. But again, it's still important that we know who who's involved. 
we get to see who all is involved in the line of, in the in that lineage. It's a kingly it's a kingly lineage, but there's there's some surprises in there. Absolutely. Now, let's not be so stiff-necked about this. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. It's personal. And he knows all of our names as well. If you, if you are in Jesus, he knows all of our names. Probably knows all of our names whether we're in Jesus or not. Think about that for a second. <laughs> so the book of Leviticus is often neglected, and many see it as lacking relevance. And I'll say perceived relevance. That's a big word there um, for the modern Christian life. But just like the rest of Scripture, we must be reminded that it is profitable. In Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all, all, word, all, all his commands are profitable. All his word is profitable, excuse me. And God has given it to us for our good. We have much to learn from it about God's holiness, our sinfulness, and what he's done in Christ to reconcile us to himself. So, if you go through Leviticus and recognize what the do's and don'ts are, it's a massive problem. They have massive issues to deal with. Only pointing to the only one that could solve all those problems in Jesus Christ. So there's a giant road map or a giant road sign, an arrow pointing, this is the way to Jesus. They get to look forward to that. We have the advantage of looking backwards to that. Um, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're reading through Leviticus. Um, and I trust you were able to, to, to read at least through most of it this week. <laughs> Um, because it, it can be difficult. So the historical context, uh, it's written mid-15th century B.C. Uh, the people of Israel are still at the foot of Mount Sinai, so they're still out there. They're still getting a really good suntan. Uh, it's hot. There's nothing there. The Lord is providing everything for them. Um, just as an aside, uh, anybody know what... Uh, manna means in Hebrew. Anybody? No, not not in the not in the language. We know what it we know what it is, but what it means in Hebrew is what is it? That's literally what it means in Hebrew. They're wandering around. The Lord's providing them with something to eat, and they're going, "What is that? What is it?" And it tells us that it was good for eat for what it tastes like, uh, like a honey wafer, sweet, and it sustained them throughout the entire day. What an awesome thing to have something sweet and sustain you for the rest of the day. I mean, how awesome is that? You're getting carbs and it's, gonna, it's not going to leave you in 20 minutes and re get ready for a nap? No. God provided this perfect food for them. Uh, that, to me, that just blows me away. Um, Anybody know what's inside the, what the contents of the Ark of the Covenant is? There is a jar of manna. There is Aaron's rod and the Ten Commandments. Exactly right. And if, you know, we've all seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, when the top comes off that thing, they, they, there's no holding back. Um, of course, Indiana Jones sticks his hand, or no, the, the, the evil German sticks his hand in there and it's dust. That's just a movie though, right? Um, so the people of Israel are still at the foot of Mount Sinai where Moses received the law and instructions for the construction of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is a functional, is, it's now it's functional, it's up and going. Um, and Exodus concludes with the construction of the tabernacle and God filling it with his glory. Uh, there's a little detail in there that it's so, it's the, the tabernacle's full of his glory, so much so that Moses cannot enter the tabernacle. That's a great little detail. 
Um, it's redemptive historical context. Israel is getting ready to enter the land that Yahweh has promised them. Israel needs to be instructed on how to live holy lives before God in that context, in that area that, the, that Yahweh has promised them. So what is holiness? Uh, we've, we've talked about it earlier. It's, it's, uh, it's separate. It's otherness. I like that word. I don't even know if it's a real word. Otherness. Uh, it's distinct. These people are to be distinct from everybody around them. Um, God is holy in that he is wholly distinct. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy as in the whole thing. Um, he is unlike anything or anyone else in a category of his own. He is completely perfect without any error or inadequacy in any aspect of his being. Now, think about that. Just perfect in every way. Um, in his love, in his justice, in his holiness. Perfect in every way. That is a concept that human beings, we can't, we can't grasp that. Where we wake up, put both feet on the floor, and we get a calf cramp, and that's not perfect. <laughs> Just getting out of bed, <laughs> um, that's not perfect. Uh, so the holiness of God refers to the absolute moral purity of God and the absolute moral distance between God and his human creatures. I'm going to repeat that. That's, that's worth repeating absolute moral distance between God and his human creatures. So this holy God calls people to himself, and therefore his people must be holy as he is. And the holiness of God's people testifies to his own holiness. Um, I'm going to recite Leviticus 20, 22 through 26. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. What a graphic picture. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nation that I am driving out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean, the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, for I the Lord am holy." and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. That last word, you should be mine. That the nation of Israel is his. Um, so how does that happen? That's what the rest of Leviticus is, is, is for. I should say that is what everything before this point points God to, or points his people to. To be perfect. So verses one are the first seven chapters of the offerings. Um, you have the burnt offering. You have the grain offerings. The peace offering. The sin offering and the guilt offering. Uh, first on the list is the burnt offering. This offering was to be made with special regards towards atonement. For personal sin. Uh, what is atonement? Atonement describes what the holy God has accomplished to reconcile and save sinners. What he has done in response to human sin to allow for restored fellowship with him. So that is what atonement is all about. Um, the Israelite who was aware of their sin would make this offering, representing the transfer of guilt Imputation, we've heard this word a thousand times. Uh, so placing that guilt on the animal through the placing of their hands on his head. This is a bloody affair. 
this is this is a lot um and it points to the incredible seriousness of sin it's god takes sin seriously um the in a covenant a covenant is made and when a covenant is broken a death has to happen and this is the death of of an offering of a of a beast if you will of a bull uh or a goat or or a dove here's the interesting thing I, it's not in your notes here it's what i listened to earlier this week is that um uh, these offerings you know uh, cattle cattle are expensive and one of the offerings that you're supposed to give is or can give is a bull from your herd perfect unblemished but what i found interesting is that he, the instructions given, that's not the only sacrifice that can be made. That's not the only animal that can be sacrificed. It goes down to a goat and then finally to a dove. Um, so it's speaking to every class of person in that society. Somebody that has a lot, somebody that doesn't have much. You know, the lowliest person can afford a dove to sacrifice that's that speaks volumes of god's love for his people um the grain offering is an act of memorial uh, it's a celebration and reverence unto god the peace offering a special act of thanksgiving towards god uh, the sin offering and the guilt or trespass offering they, they're kind of related the, the sin offering is specifically intended for sins committed unintentionally. This helps us to further understand the heinous nature of all sin, whether we know what we have sinned or not, um, as rebellion against God, even that which is done in ignorance. Um, and the guilt or trespass offering is an offering further related to unintentional sin in regards to to wrong done to uh, wrong done against others if you unintentionally did something to your neighbor and you you don't know it but something happened you may not know it but this gives you an opportunity to atone for that um, so the offerings and sacrifices demonstrate that sin leads to death and that god is to be worshiped according to his own design uh, further specific details of how these offerings were to be performed is outlined in Leviticus 6 and 7. This level of detail and God's specific instructions highlight the uncompromising holiness of God in the face of sin. Uh, I, and again, it's, it's a lesson that's repeated over and over and over again, that God takes sin seriously. And you are going to atone for that by my design, not your design, not how you want to do it but exactly how i have taught you to do it um so leviticus 8 9 and 10 is the establishment of the priesthood um moses consecrated aaron and his sons to serve as god's priests and then the tabernacle itself is the place of worship um I take it that's a page break. <laughs> so this section details the regulations for Aaron and his sons as they minister before the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel. Um, so Moses consecrated Aaron and his sons to serve as God's priests. In Leviticus 8, 10 through 13. The description of the priest's consecration and explanation of their duties in Leviticus 8 and 9 further points us to the great care taken for sinful Israel to be in the presence of the Holy God. Just another example of how serious and set apart uh, the this nation is. How special that they are to be. And in doing that all, again, all, all around, still ref by doing these things the way that the Lord wants them to do, he's, they're reflecting his glory. They're reflecting in his image to the rest of the world. Again, I told you, they're in a not such a great neighborhood. Their land is awesome, but their neighborhood's not so great. 
so we have to keep that in mind. That's again, that's that's exactly what uh, that's why God is doing this for them. So God demonstrates that He is accepting of the consecration and the people's worship uh, through there at nine, uh, Leviticus nine twenty two twenty three and twenty four. Now, get get a picture of this. Um, I hope all of y'all had a chance to watch the little video of uh, the Bible Project. It gives a great explanation of Leviticus and uh, the detail. I love those videos anyway because I'm cool. I'm a little arty, nerdy kind of guy when it comes to that kind of thing. Where, especially in graphic design, where he can they zoom up on a, a portion of the story and then go back out and then zoom up on another part. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so God demonstrates that he's accepting of the consecration of the people's worship. Now get this. Fire bursts out from the tent of meeting and consumes the offerings. How, how, do, you, how do you explain that? But the Lord in their presence. So fire bursts out without consuming anything else but what was offered. That's, that's impressive. That's impressive. Can you imagine what the people were thinking? You know, this happens, they go in, oh, it's gone. There was a fire. Wow. Who did this? God did this. Yahweh did this. The, the one that is leading them to the promised land did this. So over and over, they have reminders. And we get stuck in our head, these stiff-necked people, they're doing stuff over and over. Again. And we're still in the first five books of the Bible. And we see it over and over and over again. Sometimes we get tired. God got tired real quick when he talked to Moses, and Moses talked him out of the elimination of the people. So the people were witnesses to God's action. Their worship is not empty is not is not an empty ritual but it is an obedience to God's specific commands the consequences of worshiping God apart from his instruction are severe uh, the sons of Aaron decided to do something apart from the design of worshiping the creator God and they paid with it with what their lives Again, illustrating the seriousness of, of how God, what God takes all these things very seriously. Um, in, the K, in the King James Version, uh, it says that it's strange fire that uh, the brothers offered up to God. It wasn't how it was prescribed. So he made an example, a drastic example, but they lost their lives. Because of that. So they were worshiping God according to their own design, not what, how God says, in my design. I want it done my way, this way. Uh, God puts them to death. Nadab and Abihu's actions show that they did not truly consider God to be holy and worthy of their obedient worship. Um, and it further points on the further points on the tabernacle and the priesthood. The tabernacle pictures uh, a, a new Eden, Eden, like I told you earlier. Um, and the priests were to lead the people in appropriate worship of God. Right worship, the people humble and reverent before God. Wrong worship, the people trying to worship God however they chose. Uh, we have a negative example of that in Nadab and Abihu. Um, God dictates how his creatures are able to come before him. God's holiness has no shortcuts. God demonstrates his grace in showing the people how they can step out of their sin and into proper worship of him rather than leaving them in their sin. I think that is a, a tremendous point that we need to take home with this is that he shows them the proper way. He doesn't leave them in their sin. He gives them exact instructions on what they can do to atone for that sin. So, okay. Anybody have any questions thus far through Leviticus? I know it can be dense, but it's worth going through. Anyone? I got a discussion question for you, though. 
How does the severity of God's response against Nadab and Abihu help us to better understand God's holiness? I'll repeat that. How does the severity of God's response against Nadab and Abihu help us to better understand God's holiness? Anyone? Absolute. Nothing is quite as absolute as as death. Uncompromising. Very good word. Yeah. That's a good word. It's well beyond our finite minds. The perspective is is so far out in front of us. Uh, we are, as a people, we're myopic. We look at things right in front of us. Um, and especially the more in sin we get, the closer we look at things. Uh, and our uh, searching out other people, other things, and their sin, uh, rather than concentrating on our own. Um, absolutely. Right. Right. Strange fire was offered up and they paid for it. Absolutely. He is the unchanging, unmovable creator of the universe. These are his rules. We didn't make them up. These are his rules that he gave to his people through his servant Moses and ultimately given to the priests to, to help them live those out. But they're unmoving. You're exactly right. Yeah, that is, um, death is the ultimate example. You see that not only in what the punishment was for those two, but we also see that in the death of, the sa- of those animals that are sacrificed. It's an ultimate example that must be done properly if they are to live and to thrive in a, in a, in a, in a land that is it's is awesome let's not forget that but again it's not in the greatest neighborhood <laughs> so it's good, it's good good answers so leviticus 11 through 15 18 through 27 the holiness code then and now um You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. It's just reminding them, this is, I created this world, I created this nation, you are my people. It's a reminder. So these sections deal with instructions concerning Israel's diet. This is the section, usually when we blast through Leviticus and we get to this and we're just I just can't believe I just got through that, and now this. <laughs> this is where uh, sometimes we get stuck in the mud. So like I said, these sections deal with instructions concerning Israel's diet, ritual cleanness in childbirth and illnesses, bodily discharges. Uh, what can we learn and apply from all that? Well, we're about to find out. Um, a l- Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 tells us For I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. 
You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground, for I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. I didn't count the times that he says that in Leviticus, but it's a lot. He says it over and over and over. He just constantly reminds them, I'm holy, you are to be holy. If you want relationship with me, you have to be holy. You have to be set apart. Um, all these instructions are consecrating the Israelites, setting them apart unto God. They are to be holy, set apart because God himself is holy. The Israelites are to live differently because they are different. They are his people. God has shown them undeserved grace in saving them and choosing them to be his own people. So other instances of this teaching in Leviticus, you shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. That's, I, I've already read that, Leviticus 20, verse 26. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Don't forget, when I say Lord, it's not capital L, little o, little r, little d. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is... That's our way of saying that's Yahweh. And that is how he refers to himself throughout the entire, the entire book. He is Yahweh. Um, by saving Israel and making them his people, God has essentially attached his reputation. Let's not forget about that. He's attached his reputation to these people. That's why he's giving them, giving them all these regulations to be different from everybody else. Uh, if they obey his laws and live consecrated lives of worship before him, they will be communicating his glory to the peoples around them, around their bad neighborhood, so to speak. Um, if they profane his name by treating him less than completely holy and deserving of worship, then they tarnish his reputation. Other nations won't see them as special. Um, God will have the glory that he deserves, but his people have the responsibility to live in light of his holiness and grace towards them. Um, the holiness regulations served, in, served to remind Israel in every part of their lives that they have been set apart for God's glory. So what about us as the people of Christ? Do we need to obey these regulations when, we're, when we suspect a case of leprous disease in our household? Uh, do we need to take the issue to a priest for a remedy, as we see in Leviticus 14, 33 through 57? No, we don't. Not as, not as a set-aside people of Christ. We have, remember, that's our position now. We are in Christ, and Christ has fulfilled the law. Um, so, and that's not to say that parts of this isn't, Part, part of the law here isn't good for us. It is. Um, we're not a part of the nation state of Israel. Uh, as a church, we have been called to be a distinct political or geographic entity apart from other nations. I can see that. That's, that's a very good definition. We learn in the New Testament that all the laws fulfilled in Christ, like I said earlier, ultimately serve to the point or ultimately serve to point us to him. Yet in Christ, we are the people of God who have been set apart by him. We are to be holy as he is holy. So see that parallel of the people of the nation of Israel and us as Christians. Um, through our holiness of life and obedience to Christ, we proclaim his glory to the world. So, Again, here's the parallel. Uh, they're in, a, in an awesome land surrounded by a bunch of uh, people that are not so nice. Uh, awesome land, bad neighborhood. It's the same with us. We get to reflect his glory to the neighbors around us. Uh, whether we live in 
uh, in Ball Knob, where I grew up, or in Two Creeks, or Silver Lake, or Collins Lane, or Midway, or Lexington, or Versailles. Wherever you are, you get to represent Christ to the people around you. That's, I think we need to remember that. So as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1, 14, 15, and 16. Our righteousness comes through Christ, not through keeping the law, though. Again, we need to remember that. Leviticus 16 and 17, the Day of Atonement. And I think this will probably wrap us up. Due to the central importance of this section of the book, let's now return to the chapters on the Day of Atonement. It'll be, in it, we'll see that God provided a means of grace for when his people did not live up to his standards. One day a year, the Day of, the day of Atonement happens. Just one day. The high priest could enter the most holy place in the tabernacle and make atonement for the sins of the people that their communion with God might be restored. The high priest was first to offer a bull on behalf of himself and his family. He could not even enter the most holy place without having first making this offering. He then could serve as a representative for the rest of the people. So the first thing that has to happen is the high priest has to make a sacrifice on his own, for his own sins. So then he could step in and represent the people. Um, the high priest was first to, oh, he could, he would then take two goats, one to be sent alive out into the wilderness. The other goat would be slaughtered and its blood taken behind the veil and sprinkled on the mercy seat, which is that top section of the Ark of the Covenant. That is the mercy seat. Um, that's where we get scapegoat. You know, one goat is set free to go about into the wilderness. How long that goat's going to survive in the wilderness is a different story, but it's set free nonetheless. That's the scapegoat. And the other is slaughtered for our sins, sprinkled on the mercy seat. The Day of Atonement dealt with people's sins, dealt with the people's sins, but not in an ultimate sense. They would be reminded of their sinfulness again the next year, and the next year, and the next year. The Day of Atonement points to something greater in Christ, though, right? The ultimate Day of Atonement. It's central in the book of Leviticus because it most clearly shows us our need of a Savior, so it is central to us as Christians as well. Just as the Day of Atonement is central to them, we get to look to Christ on the cross for us. Uh, the New Testament fulfillment, Hebrews 9 and 10, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus, not by the blood of bulls and goats. Um, Jesus affected the true, day, the true and ultimate Day of Atonement through his sacrificial death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. Jesus offering on behalf of sinners is efficacious all the time. All the time. Let's not ever forget that. The Day of Atonement is both symbolic and anticipatory. They're looking forward. They don't know it, but they're looking forward. Of the work of Christ upon whom forgiveness ultimately rests. The efficacy of the Old Testament sacrificial system rested on the promise of Christ's future act. So we're going to conclude with this and hopefully be able to apply this to our lives. Feel the weight of the holiness of God. There's some serious things that we talked about today. And it's heavy. It's weighty. Uh, some might say the weight of his glory. The seriousness of sin and the necessity of coming to Christ, the perfect Lamb of God for salvation, that's how heavy it is. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart 
in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscious conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Um, any questions? There's, there could be a ton, there might not be any, but I'm open for any of them. And I, if I don't know the answer, I can point you to who does. So, just generally, who in here has read through the book of Leviticus? What's your first impressions? <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot to... If you sit down and read that in one sitting, that's a lot to, to uh, that's a lot to digest. So, what does the extensive nature of the law teach us about our own sinfulness? I mean, we're reminded of it constantly, over and over and over again. Just like the Israelites are reminded of it over and over and over, being told to be holy, be holy for I am holy, be holy for I am holy, and. So we get to look forward from their, from their vantage point to the cross that is the ultimate day of atonement, the fulfillment of the ultimate atonement. So, and so how do we know what is still applicable to us from the Levitical law? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of it isn't applicable. Some of it can be ceremonially ap applicable. Um, but ultimately, we know that Christ fulfilled the law, and that's really all we really need to know. So, anybody else? Questions? Discussion? Hmm. In, 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 that's good. And when we come to the realization of that, there's nothing that we can do. We can't do anything in our sin. Only Jesus Christ can. That's the ultimate takeaway because they are reminded through, through life. We're reminded through life of the fall. Like I said, when we get up in the morning and strain our back, <laughs> just getting out of bed. We're not perfect. This life's not perfect, but it points to the one who was perfect. There is. No, I, I, that's a great point. A absolutely. Again, because of our position in Christ, we we have that. Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> it's... Well, as, as Dr. Miller said in some of the, in one of the lessons that I listened to this week, uh, Leviticus, it's an icky business. It's a lot to take. Um, the, the blood of goats and rams and bulls and it's a, it's not a pleasant sounding thing. And then to add on top of that, some of the ceremonial laws, some of the, the health laws, if you will, of yeah, you know, I'm I'm not even going to get into it, uh, but it's I think he's he rightly said it. It was an it's an icky business, but we don't have to deal with that anymore. Thank God. 
Well, I, it's been a joy. Let me pray for us and we'll get out of here. Father God, Lord, I thank you so much for this word, this word to call us to be holy, for you are holy. And even more thankful, Father, that that holiness can only be attained through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all.